today's webinar is presented by Ross McClellan from Pacific Consulting. Ross is a Managing Director and Principal Consultant at Pacific Consulting. His consulting assignments over many years have been in both the public and private sectors in Australia, New Zealand and the US with a focus on organisation and business improvement strategies. Ross places a particular emphasis on the development of leadership practices and capability, people management practices and performance reward strategies. strategies sorry. So without any further ado, I'd like to pass the microphone on to Ross to begin. Hi and welcome everybody. Sarah and I have been sitting here for the last half an hour scheming on what we could make the best session for you today. And first of all, it's not about me, it's about you. So you've got my introduction and I looked through the participants list yesterday and I was just amazed at the number of different places where you all come from. Uh, I think a special mention is Monique from Cooper Beatty Hospital and Health Service. So not sure if you're there Monique, but I've been to Cooper Beatty and that's about as remote as it gets for a webinar I thought, so thanks for joining us. When I looked through the list, uh, you also provide information on what you're interested in and that was good because that's my orientation. It fitted well because you were talking about uh, you wanted tips, you wanted information, you wanted uh, knowledge, experience and that's more the practical side that uh, I like to focus on as well. So what we're going to do today is go through some of the PowerPoints I've got for you. We've got lots of information. Uh, maybe I'll go a bit quick, but then you can uh, have a look through the information later and Sarah's going to send you or be available to you to have some of the slides and models here as handouts. So today really is twofold. Uh, we're talking about getting the best from your staff. Uh, the unfortunate bit about that though is when we start, we're going to start on you. But before we do that, we're just going to have a look now at what the session's about today. So I was thinking about it yesterday after I looked through your information that you put through, I thought what are we all about here? And I thought okay, well from my experience and what I've learnt from lots of other experts, firstly I think I've learnt that it's about coping versus excelling. Coping, you know, not too good, usually not very happy, don't perform well, don't come home happy from work, your boss is on you or whatever. Uh, excelling, great stuff. That's personal best and that's what we're sort of talking about today. So some of the hints and the models we're using are those which have been proven to take you from just coping, getting by, towards excelling. Number two, be yourself. Great stuff. It used to be years ago the psychologists I think would be saying, oh, you, know, you have to be this perfect competency model and the perfect leader. Well, that's not going to happen. Um, being yourself is cool. It's good. Uh, however, what we're going to ask you to do is to do a few things differently so then that you can contribute more at point four and have a positive impact on others at point three. So putting those two things together, we're looking at having a positive impact on others and that's some of the emotional intelligence type things that you might have come across. The opposite is terrible, isn't having a negative impact on people. Well, they're just not going to want to work with you or have a relationship with you. Contributing is good. I kind of uh, like this idea rather than accountability or performance management. The horse is bolted usually then. Uh, a bit late holding somebody accountable after something's gone wrong, I think that's a bit of a blame game. So I like to talk, and we'll show you later, about a capability and contribution plan for you and your staff. Number five, uh, it's about doing your PB. Maybe PB can increase, whether that's at sport or at work, and that's all you're really capable of doing. We can't ask you to be who you're not or be any different than what you can perform at. Number six, big bottom line, I think. Life bottom line is are you happy or not? Talking to Sarah before, she just loves her work. How good is that? Uh, I talk to lots of people, uh, executive coaching, one-on-ones, career coaching, and the bottom line question, yeah, but after all that, are you happy? Well, if you're not, uh, life's too short, isn't it? So I think that's a good outcome that we'll talk about as well. Right, moving on. The disappointing bit I think about getting the best of your staff is that actually it starts about you and I remember when my children Kate and Dean were young and had a few behavioural problems went to a psychologist and he was pretty quick to say uh, Ross really this is uh, your fault you're the dad you should be uh, being a better leader and uh, it took a while to wear that that it actually was about me and not about them so I think at work it's the same 
And what they're saying now, a lot of the experts, is self-awareness, understanding self, the big one. If you've got that one, you're okay. If you don't get it, mm, life's going to be tough and it'll be tough managing your staff. So let's go through the eight points here to start with. So we're talking about understanding yourself. What does that mean? Know your strengths and play to them. We know it at sport. You know, if you're a good swimmer, uh, you probably do lots of swimming. If you like running, you probably do that. But I hate swimming, so I won't go in the pool. No point forcing me to be get in the pool and train. I don't like it, and I probably won't do it, and I won't be good, and I won't be happy. Same at work. We'll talk about later about strengths and team roles. Play your team roles that you like and you're good at. That's when you'll excel. Number three, weaknesses. Yeah, that's cool. We used to think weaknesses was a good term. I used to use development needs. The experts now say, yeah, come on. If we've all got weaknesses, let's just own up to it and manage them. If you don't manage your weaknesses, maybe they're going to be career derailers and you obviously don't want that. Number four, impact on others. A big one, a lot of self-awareness in understanding impact on others, by watching people's faces, body language, how they respond or react when you talk to them. Number five, knowing your thinking style, what works and doesn't work. Thinking style is an interesting one. Human Synergistics is the main company who has a model about thinking style. And so if this works, we're just going to hold this model up here. Some of you might know Human Synergistics. Let's have a look and see how that works. Hard to see, but we will send it to you. You probably get the idea at the top, those two people, constructive behaviour is the blue, aggressive behaviour is the red, green behaviour is the person down the right avoiding everything. What we want is you to be up the top, that's constructive thinking. The other thing about human synergistics is it's actually partnership thinking. Yes, we can work together, I don't have to agree with you, but we will work together. We want more of that type of thinking. And regardless of your personality, you can switch your thinking on and off, constructive, in a millisecond. So work on that regardless of your personality. If you can think positively in partnership, things will get better. Know what derails you under pressure. I use the Hogan's Leadership Profile, personality-based, great stuff, recommend it. In all my coaching, everybody uh, does the Hogan's Leadership Forecast. What's good about that, there's a part of it called the dark side, and that's a bit negative in a way, but it's possible career derailers. What will bring you unstuck under pressure? If you don't know, hard to manage it. If you do know, you can come up with a coping plan. Number seven, so be yourself we've talked about, adapt and do things differently, but don't think you have to change because you know, people don't change all that much, do they? We've got our personality, beliefs, etc. So number eight then gets into action. Work out what to do differently to get better results, firstly for you and then for others. So at the end of the session, we'll have a few action plan formats that I use and they might be helpful for you as practical tips. Right, moving on, now we go to working on others. So we've talked about you, let's talk about others. However, there's a mix here, isn't it? It's not so simple. The first one you can see is we want you to remember things so it makes it easy to work with others. So I've learnt from other experts, I like the term and I cool down if I'm getting annoyed with somebody. It's easy to change the job than the person. I work with so many senior execs who instantly go in the blame game and want to change the person. Well, yeah, that might be kind of natural, but it's not going to happen. So remember, it's easy to change the job or the environment. When things go funny with people, I just always remember that Crowder House song and uh, I feel possessed, particularly people are strange, God only knows, and I sometimes get managers who get a bit perfectionistic to remember that and uh, just chill out a bit. Number three, some people through their personal disposition and if they've got low IQ, because with a high technical society, low IQ is a, a real derailer for lots of people, but some people can't make a big contribution. So... That's just the way it is sometimes and it's a bit of a negative exercise to blame staff because they can't perform when maybe they just don't have what it takes. Number four, other people are not like you. Wow, I get a lot of this when we're doing personality profiles. There's one part of the profile about ambition. If I am 0 to 100, uh, scaled against Australian managers. If you're 80, 90%, you'll be driven and you'll push and drive and crack the whip to get things done and you'll know what to do to get ahead. If you're low on ambition, or another person is, they're going to be the exact opposite of you, and wow, that's going to be difficult if you don't appreciate that they're not like you. And there's about 
20 or 30 other things that we, they might be different. If you don't appreciate that, then you just get more frustrated. That's not going to help you. Number five. A uh, good one, this, isn't it? Belbin talks about this in his team styles, and we'll go into that in, in soon. Don't be too tough on yourself or others. It's okay to let yourself and others off the hook sometimes. Uh, I can be a bit of a perfectionist, and it doesn't work, and people hate it. Uh, if you don't let them off the hook, then they probably won't trust you, they don't think you care, and they're not going to work hard for you. If you're too tough on yourself, then people don't like that. It just doesn't work. You look like you're not settled or um, balanced. Number six, this is a good one, I like it, not my own personal stuff, uh, I've got it from another expert, being on someone's side is not the same as agreeing with them. I get this a lot with uh, government people where they have to control regulations and bylaws etc and they think that they always have to work out uh, that they're right or wrong and that's uh, not being on someone's side. An interesting one, if you think about it, that you're actually being on someone's side means you can have empathy, go along with them, partnership thinking, but you're not going to give them what they want. Different things. Sarah, we've got a poll to do. Yes, we do. So we're just going to launch a quick poll just to get some of your feedback. And we'll open this now. So the question is, think about your current issues. How much are they about you and how much are they about others? So we've got three answers there. Um, if you can just select the answer which best suits you and then click on the answer and then we'll be able to see those results as they come through. And I can see them coming through quite fast there, Ross. So we've got about half of the responses so far. Um, so A, are they caused by you? B, do you think they're caused by others? Or C, do you think it's really a combination of both? And I think there's a clear winner so far and I'll share those results. There we go, 76%. Combination of both. And the rest of the people who aren't on that percentage are the people who didn't um, answer. So you have yeah. to be quick with these polls. That's good, combination of both. Fence sitting? Yeah. Mm, could be. <laughs> Great, uh, thanks guys. So what would be the self-awareness you'd have out of that for yourself? What would your self-talk be? So it's a combination of both. Uh, are you being real to yourself? Is there actually more? about you and we didn't ask you for proportion percentage but I guess self-awareness Sarah and I were talking about this earlier but you know what was your view on this one you would think you now people being real is it possible that they're uh, I think I think good? after this webinar people will probably go back and reevaluate moving forward so yeah I think so yeah good let's move on yeah. thanks for that right next one Ah, to help you, books and things to read. First of all, and I've got a copy of that, I'll put it up in front of my face so you can see it. We got it there, so yeah. we just move it that way. Heard of this guy, he's really good. Marcus Buckingham, uh, written a couple of books. Uh, he's This one about putting his strengths to work turns around the old competency model. You know, he, he, if you had in leadership where you have a competency model with a list of things that you're supposed to be good at and you have to be good at everything. Well, he said, uh, that is not going to happen because we've got strengths and weaknesses. We love things, we loathe things. You won't do the things that you loathe. And focus on your strengths, and that's cool, and manage your weaknesses. So that book I recommend if you want to read through it because it changed my orientation to things, and I find it really helpful. The thing that I totally unrecommend is, is buying his CDs, which would have to be the most boring things I've ever had. I, I listened to CD1 driving to Canberra once. I think by Goulburn I had to get out of the car. I couldn't take any more. It's so boring and slow. His book's good. Don't recommend the CD. Now, the next one. I like this. It's, it's new last year by Hugh Mackay. The, you might have heard him, the Australian uh, researcher, sociologist, etc. What makes us tick? Two really good things that I learned out of this book, and I recommend it to clients I'm coaching. The he talks about there are 10 desires that people have and they often conflict and we don't know which desire is leading us. So there's two things I learnt from to start with is A, is it's absolutely pointless asking why did I do that or why, why did they do that? Because if he's right, there are 10 conflicting desires which we can't work out which one. You know, the desire for control, the desire for happiness, the desire to make something happy can actually all conflict. The other thing out of Hugh Mackay's book I got, and it's the first desire, which was an eye-opener for me, is the desire to be taken seriously. 
uh, one. I recommend uh, reading the book because sometimes I find I don't take my partner Elaine seriously, uh, sometimes I don't take my kids seriously enough, and I think that's not good. Uh, the desire to be taken seriously, therefore, is probably a key determinant of you being a good manager and getting your staff to work for you. Because if you don't take them seriously, what do they think? Oh, you don't care, you don't trust them, you don't respect them. So that's a good handy hint. Second one he had in that, another eye opener, he said, of the 10 desires, the only one which has a real downside is the desire for control. And if you read the book and think about it, uh, I, I often find, and I see it in others, it's not just control freak stuff, although that's extreme, and usually the language is, oh, they should have, or the government should, or I should. And should, they say, is about the most negative, destructive word in the English language. And the should is that things, you know, I should have control of things. Well, come on, it's not, he'd say in the book, it's not like that. It'd also work against you. So before we go any more, Sarah, we're going to do poll two, aren't we? Yes, we're going to launch another one. So you're familiar with how they work. We'll launch the next one. There we go. So are you the type of person who needs to feel that you are in control within your role? So we're talking about within the workplace now. It might be a little bit different in your personal life for some. Um, but the answers are pretty basic there. So yes, I do need to be in control. No, I don't need to be in control. And if you have anything else to add to that, feel free to type it in the messages box if you've got any comments or anything um, that may not answer the question fully. And I can see them coming through now. I can see the answers coming in through Ross, and I can, you can. tell you, I didn't, I didn't expect them to be this one-sided. Well, you've got the results. Yeah, I can't see let's them. Yet. them. Let's go. What have you got? So we had a fair wow. few people answer. Yeah. Look at that. I think Hugh Mackay might sell a few books out of this <laughs> because if he's right, uh, nearly sixty percent of you potentially have a problem. Yes. That's being a bit blunt, however. If he says it's the only desire that's got a negative downside, and I've seen it at work in coaching, then self-awareness would need to be, gee, is this working for me? Mm -hmm. Is there a downside? Am I not having good relationships? Am I Maybe I'm a control freak. Seen a few of those around, haven't we? Mm -hmm. But we just had a response from Chloe, and um, this yep. does make sense. So she said she likes being in control in the sense that she doesn't like being out of control. So that's quite interesting. Yeah, Hugh Mackay say not good. Really? No, that desire, see, that's the desire to be in control. You have any control. Can you control the weather? The government. Um, you know, who wins the footy match? Um, what your friends say to you? And Stephanie's see? also posted as well. So she's asked a question, if I don't feel I'm in control, how can I manage others well? You don't need to be in control. You just need to achieve outcomes and results and be happy. Okay, let's talk about that. Yeah. However, I reckon what we, we probably won't, I recommend you go buy the book. <laughs> <laughs> I don't get a royalty out of it, obviously. <laughs> but it's interesting reading, and I, he covers exactly what you're saying here, the need that you're not being out of control. They're not quite opposites. So a good learning, and if you do learn something out of it, then it could be more positive for you. Excellent. We're going to move on to Belbin now. Number three, Belbin team styles and roles, great stuff, do it a lot with clients. Uh, Dr. Meredith Belbin is British and a psychologist, uh, so it's uh, peer-reviewed, great stuff, none of the Woman's Weekly New Idea type uh, things in here. This is good academic stuff. It's practical though, and what we're saying here is that Belbin says there are nine different team styles and you probably prefer three, you're probably okay at three, and three is, no, I'm not doing this. This is not me, and I won't play that role. Now, I was with a client this morning. We were debriefing on the Belvin styles, and one of them won't play the role called shaper, which is cracking the whip, getting things done, make sure there's action. And he said to me, I just don't like doing it. So, well, Peter, if you don't do that, the team will suffer. That's what Belvin says. Play your natural roles. Don't overplay it, but don't sit there in silence. Women sometimes do this. The research has shown, and the team suffers as a result. So when we're talking about getting the most out of your teams, even if you didn't do the team styles uh, pro profile from Belvin, it would be good to say, what are my key strengths? What do I like doing? And I really should contribute that to the team, otherwise it won't work. And bring the best out in your staff as well. Uh, I said in there you can either visit our Pacific website or Google Belvin. 
and find out what it's about. Some good reading in that, not too technical, and very practical stuff, I find. Then number four, you ever done that uh, survey, What Makes Australia Happy Member on TV last year? Uh, good stuff again uh, from Sydney Uni, uh, School of Psychology, so highly credible stuff. There are three tests on there. Uh, I recommend to clients to do that. First is a happiness test, and it gives you a score, which if you're high, you feel good. If it's low, you go, oops, maybe I need to be happier. There's also a gratitude score. Gratitude is important for well-being and uh, happiness. And the third one, which, you, which is more detailed, is key strengths. So I often get people to do that on coaching, so we work out what are their key strengths and play to those again. A little bit like uh, Marcus Buckingham's book, where playing to your key strengths. And when several of the experts are talking the same thing, I get more comfortable thinking, yeah, it's not just one person's opinion, but it's probably going to be universally true, so then we can rely on it. And just a quick little um, note, I just had a look on the website, and apparently the yep. unhappiest people in Australia live in the suburb of North Yorbina in WA. Hmm. Yorbini, sorry. Well, I'm flying, to, I'm flying to Perth this afternoon, but I'm going to Subiaco, not to theirs. I'll stay away from that suburb. Yeah, good idea. Not happy. <laughs> not good. All right. Okay, let's move along. What have we got next? Now, you said you like practical things, you wanted tips, here we go. Some you might know, some you, you might not. Let's go through them. And by the way, if uh, you want to give me uh, an email or a call after this to talk about them, it's my business, so I don't mind spending the time. Now, we'll make that available, Sarah, so Great. don't mind doing that. Uh, some of these seem really obvious. Why are they obvious? Because we don't do them. How many managers do I coach who talk, 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 and the person sits there going, oh, yeah, as if, like, you know, I'm not taking any of this in. And if you had an, an egg timer thing on it, you'd be 90% manager, 10% staff. That's not going to work. So self-awareness would kick in to say, hey, am I talking too much now? Maybe I should be listening. The best way of listening is to pause and ask more questions. Uh, I've got, uh, you can find them, I've got lists of questions that I provide to clients and you do have to practice them. We're not taught it at school, it's not common sense. But at least you can make it your practice to ask more questions. We'll skip to number four now, we'll give three a miss for a minute. Uh, questions now, how, what, a good, why, use rarely. Uh, do you know why? Yeah, because <laughs> people under pressure. You also can get, now let me give you a half an hour while the world isn't flat, which you don't have half an hour, you've got five minutes, you're busy. How and what people don't get annoyed about. So there's a list of different how or what questions, and I find the majority of people use why, and it's a bit destructive, it doesn't work. Uh, Tom Peters, the US expert, says only use why questions in times of con you need to continuous improvement, and that's about processes, not people with emotions. Uh, back to number three. This is a good one. I learnt this at a conference at Brussels I went to and Elaine was there with me and I came back from the conference after practising this ESN technique and I came back and I was all excited about it and Elaine said to me, what I want to do tomorrow is go shopping all day. And I thought, you are kidding. The last thing I want to do is go shopping. I want to go and see the World War One monument in Brussels, Belgium. And that. So I about to get into an argument and I said, yes Elaine, I can see that you'd like to go shopping and what I need to do is look at some of the World War One monuments. What do you think? That's yes and. Now, I've never done it before. Since the five years come back from Brussels, I've never had a, a single manager who says, yeah, I know yes and. I don't know in Australia whether we even know it. <laughs> now, if you're about to get in an argument, yes and is the best thing. I use it often in local government with people who do development applications uh, where there's arguments about structures and whether I can build this or put a garage on and argument city, use yes and, I'm on your side, and I'm not, you can't have what you want, but at least I'm listening and you don't get an argument. So that one will go over once more, because if you get it right, you go yes, name, then yeah, I understand or I see, or you know, a bit of empathy. Then you put the and in, not a but, but will kill the conversation, and, and then your stuff. And you've got to be real to yourself, like with the line with the shopping, I, if I I was not being real to myself. I said, oh, yeah, I'll go shopping with you when I actually hated it and I didn't want to go. So it's and, then I want to see the World War I monuments or, yes, I've got a meeting and I can't finish this by close of business. How are we going to work it out? Yes, and is good. Now we go to number five. This is a good one. David Meister is an expert. Uh, he's British but comes from uh, the US now. He comes out here every couple of years to teach professional service companies, architects, chartered accountants, etc. 
he says, uh, never try to be right. People hate it, and boy, do I get it a lot, because if you're right, means the other person's wrong. If it's a customer you're arguing with them, not good. So I often say to myself, am I trying to be right now? And if I am, say, well, I'm not trying to be right. doesn't matter who's right. Let's get an outcome here. So check your thinking on that one. A lot of people do it. So instead, you can use, well, from my experience, uh, bom 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 bom. Then you're not trying to be right because we've all got different experience. Then the number seven, what's your experience? Now that's a pretty good, uh, in human synergistics term, blue partnership thinking, working together, not arguing. Little techniques, practice them, they all work. Uh, number eight, I was listening to the radio last night, uh, driving back, and. The uh, chief exec from IRG Insurance was on the line, I think uh, Ross Greenway or whatever on 2, uh, 702, and they were talking about the new, the introduction of maternity leave. Oh, sorry, we are talking about yep. it. Yep, much more maternity leave. Really generous. I'm not going to argue with that. Good. And. <laughs> and. So uh, the interviewer said uh, to the chief exec, what do other companies do? You know, you're so much more generous. Why do you provide this and other companies don't? Amazing answer, she said, I don't know what other companies do. At IAG, we, bom, 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 on he went. So about to get sucked into maybe a negative, a comparison, and that's the, I don't know about that, what I do know is. So he keeps control, positive control, but doesn't get sucked into talking about things that really are not what he's there for. Hey, number nine's good. Do you give staff enough recognition? We're not going to do a poll on this, but real good. In my coaching and, and culture surveys all the time, staff wanting more recognition. Uh, thank yous are good, and it takes much more than that, but at least it's a great start. A lot of companies now have formal recognition and reward programs, even government, good stuff, more recognition. If you want your staff to work for you, lots of recognition is good, as long as it's genuine and you're not you know, mm. um, being insincere. It might also be a good idea if any of you, any of you um, have any, any ideas on how to um, reward your staff or anything that you're currently doing to type it in the messages box. Yeah, great. Um, We've got some um, ideas just from these practical things that you can say or do. So Stephanie's saying that she thinks that asking more questions is the key when she has a staff member who has indicated that they have fully understood the task, but it turns out that they haven't. So she keeps asking more questions. That's also a good tip. Yeah, it is. Um, also, um, she also says, asking, um, sorry, Stephen says, asking staff to translate instructions into their own words shows if they understand, but it also empowers them. Good. as well, um, and also just to contextualise and conceptualise. What does that mean, I wonder? That's big. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us that? more. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe if you want to add to that. That would be good. Yeah. We move along? Yes, let's go. And then you pull up as we go, Sarah, on people's comments. Yeah. Good. So now let's get into the team. Uh, here we come a little bit, a combination of Belbin team styles and then Marcus Buckingham's booking about teams. So what they say, in my experience, is one, everyone has different team styles. So that's good. We're going to be different, aren't we? So that's a good admission. Uh, don't get into black hole thinking or behaviour, Belbin says, by getting frustrated because people have different team styles to you. Because people in teams are not well-rounded. Nine styles in Belbin's teams, no one is tops at the nine. Not going to happen. Number three, a team is well-rounded by different team styles. Um, Marcus Buckingham talks about a well-rounded team is a team of non-well-rounded individuals, if you get that. Uh, kind of obvious, but gee, so many managers I do, we think that, you know, kind of, you know, they're just not big picture, that person. You know, I'm big picture and they're not. Well, yeah, of course they're not, because not everybody's the same. I mean, it's kind of obvious, so stop playing the game that says they should be exactly like me or the same, because you don't want them to. You want a well-rounded team because exactly because the rest of us aren't well-rounded. Put us all together, and in the Belbin work I do with clients, I put up an aggregate profile. Uh, we'll put one out so people can have a look at mm -hmm. it, Sarah, and you see the gaps of the nine styles. I had one the other day where there was the team style called team worker, which is kind of the people side, the social side. No one was top preferred on it. So you look at the business, and they have lots of trouble with people, with customers, industrial, etc. Number four, people play to their natural and preferred team styles and are happier. If you don't like going to the footy, 
and you do like going to art galleries, you're not going to say every Saturday afternoon, oh, gee, I should go out to the footy, because you just don't like doing that. So it's not natural, it's not preferred. You'll be at the art gallery or going to a uh, performance, etc. And that's okay. So the more we let people play their natural and preferred team styles, the happier they're going to be, the more they'll contribute. Uh, if you want to get the best out of your team, then that's the way to do it, they'd say. Because, number five, you're not making people play to their weakest styles. And there's so much of that where people are expected to do roles they might not like admin and you're forcing them to do it. Well, it's better to manage it. Give that away to somebody else. Uh, and if you're saying you can't, then maybe that's a bit inflexible. And maybe you should give that away to somebody else who will perform it well. Next. We have a poll. Good. Yes. Thank you. <laughs> so um, so just going to open up the last poll. So this one, um, how often do you currently have one-on-one -on -one sessions with each of your staff? And I guess if you're not a manager, um, maybe um, reverse the question. So how often do you have one-on-one -on -one um, sessions with anyone else? And while people are answering that, um, just on the um, recognition, the employee recognition um, that we we're talking about earlier. Yeah, about, good. So Laura said that within her organisation they have exceeding expectation awards based upon their organisational values. Um, so they actually reward people within their organisation who are demonstrating these values. Um, and she said that it's a certificate and a gift for their annual awards and that they've just introduced quarterly awards to. Um, they're still working on what that includes and what they will be asking. Um, so, yeah, that's a, that's a good idea. I think values are a great system to have in place and rewarding people based on those is a great idea. Good. I think on top of that, the idea is to reward people for incremental change as well. So maybe uh, I might not exceed the highest standard, but I might have exceeded my own personal standard by a specific behaviour. Mm -hmm. Maybe uh, that would be worth recognising as well. Because if I'm not brilliant at customer service, I'm never going to get an award. Mm. However, maybe I've um, had one situation where I was pretty good with a customer, mm -hmm. and that's my personal best, and that'd be good to say, thanks, that's great, you're getting there. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. Not, um, the, not the best of the best, you know, which then the same people always exceed. It's like sport, isn't it? You know, the fastest runner, the fastest swimmer. Mm. So what have we got now? There we go. So we've got the majority on weekly. Yeah. I take that's a good thing, Ross? It is. What do we add them up, though, Sarah? We've got weekly, monthly, quarterly. No, we're doing six months. No, what have we got? 40, 50, 60 odd percent? Yeah. Mm. Okay, that's good. We'd normally expect, wouldn't we, that we'll get six monthly or annually. Uh, that's a good trend then, because performance management usually is that horrid annual performance review, which uh, normally doesn't go over that well. If you're doing weekly and monthly, I think that's great, mm -hmm. and keep it up. Great. The other question we're going to ask, we won't hear specifically, but what I often find though, if we ask the next question, when you have those discussions, what do you focus on? Is it A, you don't have to answer, this is not a poll now, or are we going to make a poll? No, I think... Oh, no, good. Yeah, do you focus on just the work, like how's that project going, what happened to that report, uh, or do you also focus on how you're going? Um, anything I can do to help you, how you're finding me as a manager, uh, anything that I could do differently will make life easier. That's kind of a bit more people-y feelings type stuff as well. goes well. Yeah, if yeah. people maybe just want to share their thoughts in the messages box yeah, on great. what they actually focus on, we can all then actually see them. Um, I've got a feeling it may be a mixture of more than just one. So Good. Great. Now, a couple of formats for you to use. These are public domain type stuff, uh, so uh, you can use them. First one, work out what you want and be clear. Uh, the first thing I do in coaching people is let's start with you and what do you want? So question number one there we've got without a number on it, what will make this a brilliant year for me personally and professionally? So that's for you. Good to get clear on that and what you want because if you don't know what you want and I work for you, how will I know how to help you get it? Then what are some of the main things I should do to achieve this? Things I want to do more of and less of. The more of and less of model is a really good one used internationally. And it's much better than, you know, kind of pull your socks up, you know, make sure you get your reports in um, by close of business, etc. Uh, and find both with yourself and others that more of and less of is a really effective and a bit more humanistic way of dealing with things. 
So that's number one, that's about you, but you can equally use it with other people. Talk to your staff, you know, what's important to you, what's your strategy for the year? What would you like to do more or less of? Next one. Uh, this is a longer sheet, we've just condensed here. So this one now is about uh, rubber hits the road type situation, specific actions. In coaching people, the faster I can get them to this, the better I find. If they're not ready, they'll tell me, but some people are pretty quick and they'll say, yeah, my goal is to, I want to be a better manager. I want to communicate more clearly so that people understand, etc., etc. Okay, what do you want to do first? Because that's the most positive. Things I'll start doing. Well, number one, I need to write down clearly my thoughts first, okay? What else are you going to do? Number two, uh, I need to have more regular one-on-ones. Good. Number three, etc. So we actually have eight things to start doing. This is the abridged version because the experts say it's much easier to start doing things more positive. Second category, things I'll stop doing. Well, I'll stop coming in each day and closing the door for the first two hours and sorting my own emails out because that's not very much uh, making people feel welcome in the office, etc. Next thing I'll stop doing is interrupting people uh, and telling them I want them to come in with solutions, not problems, because that just turns them off. Yeah, that sounds good, okay? Now, pat on the back, the third carry, things I'll continue doing. Yeah, well, I'm going to continue walking around the office uh, or the factory or whatever and talking to people. I think that works, okay? So you get the idea? So start doing, stop doing, continue. Nice little model, up to you, it's your life. If you don't want to put them down, that's okay. But if you don't, you probably won't get better results. Mm -hmm. This one works well. Do it with everybody in coaching. And you can do it with your own life at home as well as at work, obviously. Next one. So now if you want more from your staff, this is the want more or less of. Uh, I have a friend who's an industrial lawyer, to be honest, I got this from, and this actually can be used in industrially in performance management. Uh, that's where it first came across. I use it in coaching to, get, to help managers get the best from their staff. Uh, my experience is managers find it extremely difficult to request different work and behaviour from their staff. It's so easy to blame. So this helps you get clear on what you want from other people. Now you're not asking to change, you're not asking to change the personality, you are asking uh, however to do more of something, less of something, continue doing because you like it and I've added in the fourth one on the bottom there. Now I had a colleague once years ago said the only thing leaders need to keep asking is what can I do to help and if you're sincere and they're sincere and you, they say after a while, well actually nothing, you've done everything. You're doing pretty well, I think. So in the important fourth bit there are things uh, that I'll do to help you. So it's not sink and swim, as a lot of managers sort of leave you, or you're accountable for that, you fix it. Well, come on, this is a team, we're working together. So that's the idea here. If you want someone to do something differently, ask them what you want them to do more of, less of. Uh, pat on the back with what they're currently doing, and then this is how I will help you. So that's our last slide. Sarah? Yeah, just going through some comments just um, on some okay. of the stuff that you've touched on. So Stephen uh, makes a comment that some people are simply better suited to working on tasks individually and this is how they perform within the team. So what would what would be your thoughts around that, Ross? Not sure the question yet. Some people are... Just a comment, really. ...suited to work on tasks individually. Yeah, I guess if that's their team style. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Why not? Because you can change the job. And if that's their preference, you're not going to change them, are you? Exactly. Because you go back and say, no, 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 I don't want you working for John, I want you to work as part of this big team and I want you to do it all the time. Uh, uh, not going to work, not going to be happy. Mm. And that talks back to Catherine's question. So right. how do you deal with a member of your team who struggles to work as part of the team? Yeah, easy to change the job and the person, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It can be quite complex. You can do personality profiles, you can send them the counselling for three years. But gee, you know, mm. yeah. Probably easy to change the environment, mm -hmm. um, hard for them to do it. You might be able to talk to them about it, but it could be so deep ingrained in their personality or life experience that uh, mm. maybe change the environment and the job. If you can, if you can, you can't always, but if you're a manager with some flexibility, that is if you want to keep them mm. and help them contribute. Mm. Yeah. Great. And just on, you know, talking earlier about people, um, whether it's their weekly or fortnightly or monthly meetings, um, we've got a mix of responses. Um, so Lindsay says that they actually do a bit of both when they have their um, reviews or meetings. So they start with the work tasks and then make it more broad. 
Um, Tanya says that um, they talk about specific work responsibilities. That's how they fo that's what they focus on. So um, asking things such as how are you travelling? What's the focus for next month? And then working on their um, personal development. Um, and and then Stephanie also sends, uh, says that she tends to ask questions about how she's doing as a manager and how and whether or not she can do anything different to assist um, as part of the in, within the review process. Um, so that's just a, just a good mix. Hmm. Good. Excellent. Bit, um, I've got another bit to put in. Yeah. The bit I didn't put in the slides is I like an approach to performance management called capability and contribution. Uh, I think it works much better. So the idea of that in terms of this session today, how do you get more, how do you manage your staff? So maybe ask the question, you first and then second, what am I capable of or what's this person capable of? And you can work through that with them. Then given that, what can they contribute firstly themselves and then secondly to the team? So that seems to me to work much better than here are your KPIs. Well, you've probably got those as well. Um, but not just by themselves. Here's your KPIs, KRIs, and you know, head down, bum up, you're accountable for this and don't screw up sort of thing, shish. Not the most encouraging environment for performance, but I find a lot of managers do that. So let's twist performance management around to say, uh, capability and contribution plan, uh, get the person involved, and uh, use some diagnostics like the Belvin team profile or the Hogan's leadership or the human synergistics, whatever you find will be most helpful. So you learn a little bit about what makes them tick and out of that you and they draw up the capabilities and given that what can they contribute to the team and then give them recognition on that. So as an overall format to use I think capability and contribution is a fairly positive way to get the best out of your team. Mm -hmm. You'll never be a perfect manager so you can try your hardest and you've got a couple of formats here for you and other people, and then if you put that together as capable and contribution, there's probably other things that other people know, but that's an awful good start. Mm, yeah, and I think Chloe's just really wrapped it up, so right. she said that changing the job for the person in an equal team environment might not be fair on other staff taking on additional responsibilities, and I think that really just talks to the fact that each situation and scenario is different, isn't it, and they all have to Yeah, it does worry me though, because I get no when yeah. I look at that. I get can't do it yeah. and I hear that a lot, got a lot of pushback. All the experts would say, mm, think about it a bit more because the current way is not working and, mm -hmm. and that'll be frustrating for you and you won't get results and you'll be blaming the person and maybe a new shift in thinking there would think, well, how can I work this out without being unfair because mm -hmm. she doesn't want to do that. Uh, however, you know, it's a little bit of a hiding to nowhere to say, well, the person just has to do it because that's the way it is. Well, mm. is that working? No. What's the downside? Well, people are unhappy and I'm blaming and I go home at night worrying about it. Mm. So maybe a little bit more thought. Mm. Um, if you did a team profile, it'd be easier, then you'd know what's working and what's not. Mm -hmm. But I think be careful pushing back too quickly. I get it quite a bit and I think um, work more as a partnership on that one and delve a bit more. Maybe ask the other people what they like doing, what they can give away. Usually people know. Mm, yeah. surprised. Yeah. Great. Don't give up too easily on that one, I think. Mm, yeah. Excellent. What else have we got, Sarah? That's pretty much it. But like I said, um, upon this webinar closing in a few moments, um, there's a satisfaction survey at the end. So if you complete that, we will actually send you an email within 48 hours. And that will actually have a link to the recording, so you can watch this as many times as you like afterwards. Um, it will also have a copy of the presentation slides and then also the documents that Ross has actually gone through, we'll send you those as well, um, as well as the contact details for Ross. If you do have any questions afterwards, um, you can always ask him and contact him directly. Um, I'll put that on there for you, Ross. <laughs> People can bombard you. Um, but other than that, I would personally like to thank you all for joining um, from the Redback team um, and also thank Ross for his time today. Um, it's been great and very enlightening. Um, we do look forward to seeing you at future webinars, um, so please feel free to join our community and we'll let you know when they're coming. Um, but I'd like to just hand back over to Ross um, to say your concluding comments, I guess. Yeah, so if we wrapped it all up as a summary, I think, if we go back to the beginning. So, so how do you get the best out of your team is, first of all, work on yourself. Uh, remember certain things about other people that they're not like you, that 
maybe they can't contribute. Uh, it, that doesn't mean drop your standards because we know quality and customer service, probably the two key things in business, whether it's private or public sector. Work on yourself first, get your self-awareness up so you know what might derail you, what frustrates you. Uh, secondly then, working at your PB to their PB. So how then can you work out from the different team styles or their personalities or their preferences what their strengths are? see as much as you possible, play to their key strengths, and then have some nice formats as a disciplined way to run in the organisation, so it's not just chatting. Uh, we want chatting, but we do want structured business formats, so you've got a format for your own actions, for your own strategies, and a format then to get the best out of them, and a specific format to ask them to do more or less of to get them to do things differently, and still being themselves wrap all that up into whatever you want to call it, let's say a contribution capability plan or performance plan, continue doing what you're doing now with about 60% of you having one-on-ones very regularly, that's great, so you're monitoring, uh, and then just keep working on it, continuing and work you know, on the business as they say, not just in the business, uh, and that's about as good as it gets, I think. Excellent. Great, right. hope that's so, a good summary. That's yeah, right. nice, and, nice little nutshell there. So thank you everybody, um, enjoy the rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Bye. Bye.